enjoyed the movie last night. And uh, uh, we've got a, another uh, full day planned for you. Um, uh, we're going to start off with uh, a lecture from Bruce Graeber, and then I'm going to talk about ragtime and blues and early jazz uh, around the country. Uh, after our lunch, we've got another colleague of mine, Dan Sharp, from the music department coming to talk about the relationship between the United States and Latin America, especially through New Orleans, and then we'll take your usual afternoon uh, curriculum break, and then after dinner, you're all going out to Bullets Bar to hear uh, Kermit Ruffins, a great local musician uh, who runs a small combo that plays uh, jazz and blues and R&B and a little hip hop. Um, and uh, that, that's a great show in a neighborhood bar, and it's also an early show. It's something that I really wanted to make sure you all got out and heard some music, and that's a, Tuesday night's a great opportunity to do that. So without further ado, I'm just going to introduce uh, Bruce Rayburn. Bruce is the, the director of the Hogan Jazz Archive, and he's also the director of the special collections here, uh, the library collections here at Tulane. So uh, Bruce Rayburn, give him a welcome. Good first day. Yeah. Yeah. Tramping around the New Orleans sun, enjoying that. Lots of interesting things. And the best way to learn about this environment is to be there at ground level and to experience it firsthand. You can't theorize New Orleans, you have to experience New Orleans. Uh, the presentation that I'm sharing with you today was originally developed uh, as part of a secondary level teaching institute that Gerald Early organized at Washington University in St. Louis and funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. But the, the main thrust of the content is really to look at the relationship between urbanism in New Orleans and cultural dynamics, because what we're really talking about is uh, the burgeoning of what becomes recognized as an art form, but it certainly doesn't start out that way. When we talk about New Orleans jazz, we want to keep a functional perspective on that, which is part of what we're going to be getting into today. Uh, the other thing is that uh, you can't cover all of the origins and early development in an hour and a half. So what I'm going to try to do is provide you with ideas um, for you to uh, supplement any information that you have already uh, received. How many people have read textbook accounts of the origins of jazz in the law? Right. So there's a few. Uh, what I'm hoping to do is, is complicate uh, those models uh, a little bit. So, we start in the obvious place, and I know Freddie was talking to you about Plas Congo. Uh, the general explanation of origins uh, of jazz in New Orleans, and let me point out that not everyone agrees that jazz was born, and we want to put the scare quotes on born because it's, it's a metaphor. Uh, not everyone agrees that jazz was originated in New Orleans. Leonard Feather, Born in England, he became the preeminent became the dean of jazz criticism from the 1930s and the 1960s, challenged that idea uh, throughout his career. He said, jazz is too big to have come from any one place. He uh, liked to think that there was linkage between jazz and slavery, and wherever the institution of slavery existed, there was a potential for jazz. The seed of jazz was there. Uh, however, it was largely a theoretical approach, not really based in empiricism. And what I'm hoping today, uh, to do today is to acquaint you with some of the details of the New Orleans environment that uh, counter uh, Leonard Feather's arguments. I happen to think that New Orleans has a very good claim to being a place where jazz originated, although we don't want to limit ourselves in discussing jazz origins to only focus on New Orleans. We want to open up our perspectives as broadly as we possibly can. And this is what most accounts of jazz origins do right off the bat, which is they give you a dichotomy of African and European. The African, represented by Plas Congo, as Freddie uh, undoubtedly uh, told you yesterday, this is a place where syncretism occurs. And so even though we can talk about specific African ethnicities in the early 18th century, for example, between 1719 and 1731, the greater part, over 60% of the slaves that were brought were from Senegambia. Following that, you get a grafting of a layer of uh, Bakongo people. Uh, toward the end of the 18th century, early 19th century, then you start seeing Yoruba. But Freddie's point of view in her book is that all of these uh, different uh, specific West African ethnicities are blended 
in the experience of class conduct. Uh, and so one can challenge the idea that it's possible to pick out a Senegambian thread or a Congo thread. And if you read the literature, usually the model that's applied to New Orleans music is a Yoruba model uh, utilized by Robert Ferris Thompson. Uh, just to give you a little ironic moment, though, uh, when you talk to a lot of specific uh, New Orleans musicians like Sidney Bechet or um, Tony Basley, they will specifically identify as Senegalese, even if they can't prove the connection. So there's something there. We don't want to think that things got so blended that you can't differentiate, because the music of the Senegambia is very different from the music of the, the, uh, the Congo, Central West Africa. But all of that came to New Orleans and to some extent created a unique situation here in the grafting of Bakongo on top of Senegambia. Uh, from Africa, the components, the musicological components we always talk about would be uh, polyrhythms, heterophony, pitch bending or microtones, and to some extent song forms. Uh, Thomas Brothers wrote an excellent article, not on a bibliography, called Solo and Cycle in uh, Musical Quarterly, uh, basically looking at structural elements that are African in the solos of Louis Armstrong and Lester Young. And he believes he found them. Uh, so there are elements that we would define as African, but if we put them in Congo Square, what we're talking about is a transformation from African to African American. Did you just say those qualities again? Yes, um, polyrhythms, heterophony, pitch bending, microtones, blue notes is, is another term uh, that's used, and song forms. Now, song forms is something we usually equate with European. We think of you know the popular song, the, the sort of great uh, uh, American ballad or whatever as you know the raw material of jazz and of course the blues which is a song form but it's also a feeling so that complicates how we define the blues right from the get-go. Uh, blues would be African-American although I recently made a trip to Senegal and I heard some Kalan players and what they were doing sounded like the blues to me. So we don't want to totally exclude the possibility that some things that took root in North America are very African and retained a lot of their African characteristics. Although, one can make uh, distinctions between what a Halam player does and what uh, someone in the uh, Mississippi River Delta uh, does on a guitar. Representing the European heritage, what better symbol than the French Opera House? It burned in 1919, just when jazz was sort of attaining full thrust. Uh, that's an irony that uh, I'm not going to go into. <laughs> But when we talk about uh, European music, Eurocentric music, uh, we're talking about things like melody and harmony and true pitch. In other words, the whole idea is that there is a contrast between the African and the European. And to some extent, people would say, well, the African is more flexible. They bend a pitch instead of you know, aiming right for the center. And the Eurocentric is more rigid. And I'll let you draw your own conclusions after you've been through the rest of this course, which is true. Uh, but we want to keep in mind that when we're talking about African and European models, we're talking about two very different forms of civilization. Not civilization and the absence of civilization, two conflicting forms of civilization. The problem I have with the standard jazz origins model is that, first of all, it's a bit simplistic in that it basically focuses on musicological components that are old world, African and European. As far as I'm concerned, where the action is in studying jazz origins is the vernacular culture of New Orleans. This is why Place Congo is important, because even before jazz, we know there's something going on here, something special. As Freddie, I'm sure, told you, Place Congo is not typical of the Southern experience. It was the exception from that. Because of fear of slave rebellion, uh, African drumming and dancing is prohibited. Uh, you can be executed. In New Orleans, they tried to regulate it, non-conforming zoning, the very typical New Orleans approach to culture. <laughs> Instead of just looking at African and European, what I'd like to suggest is a more complicated model. Uh, we are going to include transatlantic culture, old world culture, because in New Orleans, for example, uh, the first uh, 
established opera and ballet companies from the 1790s on. They're in New, uh, New Orleans, not New York or Boston. Uh, <coughs> African transatlantic culture. You read Freddie's book. There's an argument to be made there that it survives and even flourishes in New Orleans. And, and when we talk about New Orleans music, uh, it's often defined by scholars as black music. And there's a good reason for that, even though we don't want to limit our sights to all the ethnic groups that uh, became involved in the early development of jazz. But we want to emphasize this African-based uh, character to the music, because even if you're talking about, say, uh, military rudiments on a snare drum, when Baby Dodge does them, he doesn't sound like he's reading from a book. He's putting some extra stuff in there. He's messing with it. And we can perceive that as, as something deriving from the African experience, this, this sort of um, uh, reconfiguring uh, received culture. But in addition to the transatlantic, which is very important, we've also got this world of creolization coming up from the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico, from Central America, from Havana in western Cuba, from Santiago de Cuba in eastern Cuba, which is more Caribbean than Havana is, uh, from Barbados, from Guadalupe and Mar Martinique. All of this is coming into New Orleans. <coughs> Think of New Orleans as sort of um, a site of various tectonic cultural plates in your sector, if you like. One of them is transatlantic African European. Another would be this creolized um, culture out of the Gulf and the Caribbean, including things like clave and habanera rhythms. But also the idea of, of sort of um, uh, identity as a mask, or identity as something that's fluid and can be manipulated and configured, what some people would identify as mestizaje in Central America. Creolization has those implications in New Orleans too. Carnival is just one example of how that plays out in the culture here. But, and of course, you know, the argument is, well, Clave Habanera that's imported from Cuba and San Domain, Haiti. But given the implications of that Senegambian foundation with Congo layer on top of it, I think we need to also at least think about the possibility of indigenous development of those rhythms in New Orleans, because they're so basic here. They really are. And somehow, New Orleans guys, drummers know how to make habanero and clave swing, which is, if you read Ned Sublet, he says, no, those are two different rhythmic worlds that don't intersect. New Orleans, they intersect. Um, there was slave trade going on in Central and South America as well. So how many of those um, Af originally African people would have traveled, spent some time in that part of the world and then come up to New Orleans. Would that have happened? Read Rebecca Scott. Uh, Degrees of Freedom is a good place to start. Uh, and then Freedom Papers. And this is where the micro history becomes important because ultimately if we want to tell the story of jazz origins or we want to tell the story of people in New Orleans and creolized heritage, we have to talk about individuals. We really have to get to know who they were as people. And that's what Rebecca does. But essentially, let me just give you one idea. Under the French, Saint-Domingue was a slave colony. And then, for various reasons, because of the politics of the French Revolution, they freed the slaves. But if you are freed in Saint-Domingue, and then you flee to Santiago de Cuba, which still has slavery, what are you? And then if you leave there and you go to New Orleans, what are you? And this all plays out through the courts and, and individual micro-histories. Uh, so that's a very big part of what we're talking about, but it's something that's pretty much played out by the time of the Civil War. So it's, it's part of the backstory of jazz origins, but it's not so much um, a part of the actual uh, narrative of jazz origins. But the third major plate that I want to get into is an extremely important one. It's American vernacularism. And this is what you do not find in the Caribbean. This is one of the special elements. This creolization meeting the American vernacular, very important. And in other words, we're talking about all the culture that is built in the United States over the course of the 19th century in the Mississippi River Valley, including Kunjai, river-related work songs. Kunjai is a river-related work song. How do you spell that? Uh, various uh, spellings, but uh, the Anglophone version is C-O-O-N-J-I-N-E. 
in French, which you find in New Orleans, it's C-O-O-N-J-A-I-L-L-E. But it's a phonetic thing coming out of African American culture. And it's basically the song that would be sung by the roustabouts when they are walking the plank, loading a riverboat. And it's got a rhythm, like all work songs have, that enables the work. But in addition to that, we could talk about alligator horse ballads. These are the songs of the flatboat men who work uh, the river, basically the Ohio River, all the way down Natchez, New Orleans. By the time they get to New Orleans, they're usually primed for a night in jail after uh, a wild uh, prelude to that. Uh, they're very colorful characters. A lot of the attributes that we see attached to alligator horse. Uh, alligator horse is basically a metaphor for the properties of work animals combined in a river worker. The alligator is, uh, is wily and maneuverable. The horse is very strong. And so the alligator horse, like you might think the flatboat man, he would have been an alligator horse. But that leads to minstrelsy. That leads to the blues. And then we factor in religious music, spirituals, what becomes gospel. Uh, later on in the 20th century. All of that is part of the American vernacular, which again, heavily influenced by African American culture. So we're seeing lots of different configurations of African American culture meeting up in New Orleans. And so if there's a case to be made for the exceptionalism of New Orleans, I think this is the strongest case we have. But when we start looking, scratching at the surface, trying to go a little deeper, we find cultural elements that are not usually part of the stories. French Opera House. Arnold Loyacano, who was with Tom Brown's band that left in 1915, one of the first white organizations to take jazz on the road up to Chicago and New York, 1915, studied music at the French Opera House. Shelley Will Morton talks about going to the French Opera House. Nicola Rocca talks about going to the French Opera House, receiving something they thought was important, which was Eurocentric culture. Creolized people of African heritage are writing uh, Eurocentric salon music in mid-century uh, New Orleans as well. Not everyone of African heritage is embracing the African heritage. Sometimes they embrace the Eurocentric. People like Edmond Dede. Basile Barres was a slave who held a copyright for a composition in 1860. And the song was uh, an ode to Confederate soldiers, the Zouaves, chaussures à pied, foot soldiers. I really abounds in the wall. Expect to find it. Is that an exception to prove the rule? Or is that, was that common? Or is that an exception to prove the rule? Is that just a really well, uh, he was probably the only slave who ever held a copyright. And of course, in 1860, things were about to change dramatically. So let's just say he's not uh, the last person of African heritage, but he's the first to sort of bend that reality a little bit. Slaves were not supposed to be writing classical music, <laughs> but they did in New Orleans. And they could attend opera in the 1830s if they had 50 cents. And since they had a free day to work on Sundays, they often did. Uh, but the French Opera House, so we think, oh, French culture, right? No, when Arnold Laicano called the music school at the French Opera House was the Milano Conservatory, because all the teachers were Italian. And we find Italians like Luigi Gabici, G-A-B-I-C-I, teaching Creole people of African heritage like Edmond Dede and uh, J.M. Dublé, as early as the 1830s. George Pauletti was born in New Orleans in the 1860s. He's of Italian heritage. And he is uh, someone who worked for 25 years as a cornet soloist at the French Opera House. So not only the music teachers, some of the stars were uh, of Italian heritage. He also taught music at Warren Easton High School on Canal. And among his students, Warren Easton in the house. <laughs> among his students were Louis Prima, Sterling Bowes, Meyer Weinberg, Sicilian, Jewish, Anglo. He is not jazz informed. He is giving them a foundation of conservatory-based 
musical instruction on which they will take their amateur-based interests and practices and wed them. And this dichotomy between the conservatory and amateurism is a key element in looking at jazz origins in New Orleans. So you can get some instruction from the Eurocentric classical background, maybe something like solfeggio, for example. It's sight singing. You don't even need an instrument. You learn about notes and, and intervals and rhythms by using your voice, by vocalizing. And then if you're good enough, your parents buy you an instrument. Uh, and then you might even go into uh, learning how to read music. Uh, not everybody did, but almost everybody had solfeggio, and then they tried to take it from there. Most of what these guys want is the ability to manipulate the instrument and get up on stage as quickly as possible. They're not interested in theory. They're not interested in arranging at first. Later on, people like Louis Armstrong, Jelly Roll Morton, will learn how to read music because it becomes a requirement in the music industry when they leave New Orleans. But in New Orleans, they usually didn't need it. George Paoletti, in other words, is not a jazz guy, but he influences jazz guys. And so uh, by backing off and looking a little bit at the importance of Eurocentric culture and the American vernacular, amateur culture here, and how people are choosing from what we would call a trick bag. Trick bag is uh, where you, you keep your grigris and uh, voodoo, uh, all, all your amulets and everything in there. I like to use that metaphor because that's what it's like for New Orleans musicians. There's all the stuff available to them. They pick what they want from the conservatory tradition. They pick what they want from the amateur tradition. They listen to everybody else in the environment. They pick what they want. They copy from the people they're exposed to. Are, is there any klezmer music here? Because I noticed there, there were some Jews here. Yes. And, and uh, we, there is an article um, on your bibliography that I'm the author of that gets into that. And I'll, I'll deal with that in a little bit. Attaching klezmer specifically to New Orleans jazz is difficult because of the challenge of documentation. But if you listen to someone like Larry Shields on the original Dixieland Jazz Band uh, records uh, of Sphinx and Sudan, for example, you will hear something that sounds a lot like klezmer on clarinet. Uh, so there is some correspondence in the Jewish population. I've been talking about Sicilians, but the Jewish population is also very important here. Meyer Weinberg, for example, I, I've already mentioned him. He became uh, the primary clarinet player for uh, Louis Primus Band in the mid 1950s. <coughs> and we will return to that theme. Now, even though he's not jazz informed, this is a guy who records in New Orleans. When do you think the earliest recordings are made in New Orleans? It's not jazz recordings, but the very earliest recordings. 1891, the Louisiana Phonograph Company is recording George Paoletti's Southern Band doing Anvil Chorus in Miserere. In other words, pulling on the Eurocentric and popular music traditions, but also Louis Vazmir, whose nickname was Bebe. There are lots of Bebe's in jazz history and origins. This is a common nickname. Uh, Vazmir was doing a comic pulpit oratory called the Brother Rasmus Sermons, very much like what Burt Williams was doing on the vaudeville stage. And Louis Armstrong later does in 1938 with the Elder Ignor sermons. Uh, but these are comedy records based in the idea of the kind of not all that trustworthy preacher at the pulpit. But he's also recording banjo accompaniments uh, like uh, Turkey and Straw, common material. No jazz here. And this is a company that goes out of business in a hostile takeover uh, between uh, Edison and uh, Columbia. Uh, in the late 1890s, and so it doesn't really survive into the jazz age. But it's interesting to think about because the way they market this material is uh, these are popular with white and black audiences, and they are, these recordings are a good cure for the blues. 1891. Recordings are on. Those cylinders have not really survived. Uh, unfortunately, one of them was reissued on document. The surface noise is so bad, you can't really get at the content. And it's one of the um, Brother Rasmus sermons, so it's the spoken word. It's not the music, unfortunately. Because of segregation, because of the Plessy decision, the, quote, separate but equal imprimatur that allowed states to legislate and control 
to black populations uh, after Reconstruction. We will always be talking about race when we talk about jazz origins. But I want to get away from that for a moment and talk about some of the other things that we need to look at that are maybe even more important in some ways, and that is the age of the participants, youth culture. One of the common characteristics of jazz is that it tended to be embraced by young people, whether they were Sicilian, Jewish, Creole, Afro-French Creole, or African American. For example, one of the uh, primary teachers, uh, Lorenzo Tia, Jr., uh, played with Armand Piron's band, uh, T-O is spelled T-I-O. He uh, is of uh, Mexican heritage, uh, but it was actually a, a family that began in New Orleans, fled the city in the 1850s because of the deteriorating racial situation leading into the Civil War, and then came back during Reconstruction. But his uncle, uh, Louis Tio, hated jazz. He was a trained Eurocentric, musically literate uh, professional. And his quote was, listening to brass bands playing jazz in the streets, listen to those idiots just messing up good music. So just because someone's of African heritage doesn't mean they embrace jazz. The older generation tended to resist it. Now once the market shifts and the people who are hiring bands all want jazz, they have to adapt or they go out of work. So again, that functional imperative, looking at what the market is demanding in terms of jazz origins, there's a shift in public taste, there's a shift in dance styles that's occurring right around the turn of the 19th and the 20th century. This band is led by a guy named Emile Lacombe. His nickname was Stale Bread. Uh, these guys all have street handles, warm gravy, family haircut. Sounds like a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> They're making music with homemade instruments. Kidori did the same thing when he was a kid in Laplace. Again, you work with what you've got. If you can't afford an instrument, you make one. It's not all that hard. Main thing is, can you make it sound good? These kids could. They worked a lot. They got a lot of tips on the street. Ultimately, Lacombe becomes a professional musician. Here he is about a decade later on guitar at the far right, with Susu Oremos, who's Salvadorian. Uh, it's interesting to look at the people who are buying the music, the audiences. We don't often get, you know, we get lots of pictures of bands in various poses, but we don't often see the audience. The <coughs> audience is extremely important. They're part of the equation. <coughs> this is what's driving jazz development in the early 20th century. And we can see these are working people uh, they are maybe having some water or lemonade up here. <laughs> this does not look like water or lemonade <laughs> there, nor does that. Uh, they're out in the vicinity of Lake Pontchartrain, probably on a Saturday afternoon, listening to some music, raising a little hell, letting off steam, because they're people that work hard all week long. They're blue-collar workers. This is the music that jazz was made for. Eventually, it becomes accepted by the elite. But this is everyday music for working people in New Orleans. Now, there's another market that coexists with jazz and, and precedes it. And that is the Eurocentrically oriented, creolized dance culture that exists in New Orleans, represented by John Robichaud from Thibodeau, Louisiana. He was uh, raised as a foster child in a white household uh, of a music instructor. In the mid-1890s, he comes to New Orleans, and he becomes one of the most successful band leaders here, playing in the Eurocentric tradition. In the 19th century, violin was really the, the dominant frontline instrument. It was the leader of the ensemble. Jazz will change that and replace the violin with the cornet and the trumpet. Much more strident, much more powerful, and one could even argue more expressive. Not necessarily. One of the things you can do on a violin is microtones, just the way, same way you can on a slide trombone. But most of these Creole uh, musicians are not trained to play microtones. They're trained to read Eurocentric music, and that's what they perform for upscale audiences. 
This becomes the competition of Buddy Bolden, but it represents this, the importance of Creole culture in New Orleans at the time in which jazz is emerging. Particular neighborhoods have slight differences in terms of how those configurations uh, occur. For example, that's the French Quarter right there. From Dumaine to Esplanade, the lower French Quarter, highly Sicilian, part of what they called uh, Little Sicily, but also where Danny Barker, Afro-French Creole, grew up. Along the rim of the quarter near Burgundy Street, there's an African-American contingent. Ultimately, the Morgan brothers, uh, Isaiah Morgan and uh, Sam Morgan, end up there. There's also a very large Hispanic population in the lower French Quarter. Ray Lopez, who was a cornetist with Tom Brown's band from Dixieland. His father performed at the French Opera House. He's a, a jazz musician. He grows up in the lower French Quarter. And uh, Martin Abraham, uh, Mexican, Spanish lineage, nickname was Chink Martin, starts out as a guitar player playing Paso Doble, very ethnic Spanish music, ends up as a jazz bass player to get work. Uh, that's what the lower French Quarter looks like. Treme, which can be extended all the way out here, uh, is largely African American and Creole, but also has German, also has French, and this is the borderline of what becomes the uh, notorious Storyville district, where uh, prostitution, a ghetto for prostitutes was created between uh, 1897 and 1917. Another exercise of non-conforming zoning, which is, well, prostitution uh, is illegal everywhere except this blind spot. And that's Storyville. And then there was a black Storyville in what's called Back of Town. This is the Seventh Ward. That's the Creole Ward. <clears throat> Treme is more African American in terms of its cultural footprint. Seventh Ward is more Creolized. <clears throat> this is where Perez comes from, for example. The Begards, Barney Begard and Alex Begard from the Seventh Ward. Uh, Albert Dominique, all Creole. But their neighbors are Sicilians in many cases. And in Treme, very strong Sicilian population, that's where Louis Prima is from, on St. Peter Street in Treme. The west bank of the river, which ironically is more or less uh, south of uh, the French Quarter, Algiers is another creolized crazy quilt area. That's where Peter Bocage came from. Manuel Mineta comes from there. And Ed Hardy came from there as well. And uh, Lester Young uh, grew up in Algiers. Uptown, we find some very interesting things as well. Central City is one of the primary incubators for jazz talent. This is where Buddy Bolden comes from, 2300 block of First Street. Charles Bolden is symbolic of the first jazz band, basically. Whether he was the best or the first, we don't know, but Don Marquis wrote an excellent book about him. You can learn a lot by looking at Buddy Bolden. Uh, the ups and downs of an early jazz guy in New Orleans. Central City uh, is largely blue collar. That's really what defines it. Along, this is Louisiana Avenue, Howard Avenue, St. Charles Avenue, and Claiborne Avenue. First Street, Claiborne, uh, Carondelet, right here. Very large Jewish uh, settlement, tended to be uh, Ashkenazi Jews coming in the late 19th century. Living side by side with African Americans like Bolden, and Bolden's next door neighbor, Larry Shields, clarinetist with the original Dixieland Jazz Band. He is Irish American. His father, uh, Jane Shields, was born in the U.S. His father was an immigrant from Ireland. But his mother, Emma Punicki, was Hungarian. So in terms of ethnomusicology, how do we deal with Larry Shields? Well, interestingly enough, his brother, uh, Harry, talks about when his parents were married, that Emma's family, her father and brothers, all played for the wedding in 1870. Uh, they were Hungarian musicians who did not read music a string band playing by ear, in other words, gypsy jazz. Uh, they use the term jazz, it's too early for jazz, but they are head musicians, improvising musicians who are not reading music. They're playing uh, Eastern European folk music. Uh, you don't often hear about that in the New Orleans environment, but there it is. And that's part of the heritage of the clarinetist on the first jazz recording, Larry Shields. 
Finally, uh, oh, up by Toledano, many they do. Women are also important in the jazz story. Jelly Roll Morton, who is often identified as the first composer of jazz, first guy to put it on paper, even though he had to hire Lovey Austin to do it for him because when he started composing, he wasn't fully musically literate. Hired a woman to do it. But his first exposure to the blues that was the epiphany that sort of got everything moving, his godmother lived in the same block as Mamie Daydun, and that's spelled D-E-S-D-U-N-E-S, -E although you'll find it spelled differently in Lomax's account of Jello Rose Life. But she is very likely the illegitimate daughter of Rodolphe de Dune, the top of Creole culture, except she, was, she had fallen. She had worked as a prostitute. She tried to get out of the business. The pimp caught her, immolated her, cut off four fingers of her right hand. She could still play the blues on piano. This had already happened when Jelly Will Morton got his first exposure to her. He later writes Mamie's Blues, or 219 Blues, in her honor. Which is a remarkable piece of music for various reasons, not just because of what Morton was memorializing, but because this is a creolized blues with a habanera rhythmic structure to it. Usually we don't find clave and habanera as the rhythm template for the blues. In New Orleans, within the Creole community, you do. Another aspect of this Creolized culture that the intersection of American vernacular, the blues, and this uh, Gulf Caribbean, uh, and possibly indigenous New Orleans, rhythmic template, uh, clave and habanera. Finally, the Irish Channel, also Crazy Quilt, but this is where people like Steve Brown and Nick LaRocca were from. The difference here is that you have alternating blocks of white and black. You don't have mixed blocks the way you do in Central City or in Treme. And that created different attitudes. That created an insularity so that people like LaRocca, who's the leader of the first band to make a recording, the original Lee Sun Jazz Band, claims that it all came from him and that he was never influenced by uh, black musicians in New Orleans at all and that they deserve no credit for jazz at all. That was LaRocca's story. Now, one immediately goes to his repertoire and goes, well, how come you're playing all these blues then? Are you telling me you invented the blues too? Well, with the Irish, what is it, the Irish band? Um, Irish Channel no. is the name of it. And this basically runs from Louisiana Avenue uh, down to Howard Avenue as well, which is sort of like where the Central Business District ends. Uh, the Brunings family also grew up in the Irish Channel. Uh, but Bill Johnson, the leader of the original Creole band, also resided in the Irish Channel. And uh, he, he was a person of mixed European and African heritage, not from New Orleans, but he was read as a Creole. And so he therefore named his band the Creole Band because uh, the cachet, using the term Creole. Okay, here's Bolden, and this is where we really start the jazz store. Bolden's cornetist in the back. Uh, the drummer was not present. It was probably D.D. Chandler. He did use drums. Frankly, you've got to have drums if you're going to play New Orleans jazz. Now, if you get a chance to read Larry Gushy's book, Pioneers of Jazz, about the original Creole band, you'll realize that they had a drummer for their first gig, and then when they went on the vaudeville stage, they left the drummer behind. So what did they sound like? Well, I think he still makes a very compelling argument that this was a proto-jazz band preceding Tom Brown's band from Dixieland and the original Dixieland Jazz Band. In other words, there was uh, an African-American Creolized band out there first, but they weren't working with a drummer and they were working on the vaudeville stage. Something that has to be emphasized about early New Orleans jazz is that it's a dance music, not meant to be a concert music. It's meant to be a functional, social music that allows people to get together and respond to the feeling that the musicians are generating by reacting viscerally. The kinesthetics of jazz dance are very important. In the 19th century origins of jazz, you'll read a very ingenious piece of research by Lawrence Cauchy, which is he looks at dance cards from 1894 to 1896 and the transition in popular dances that, that he sees a trend. And it's a trend away from the walls and the quadri and the uh, mazurka and the shottish and in other words the polite dancing much of the group dancing not couple dancing closed couple with the exception of the walls uh, that was the proper 
musical uh, dominant paradigm for the 19th century, but what it's moving toward is more functional steps like the two-step and the one-step and then eventually the slow drag and the shag and very tight couple dancing, which is, shall we say, less proper in terms of its implications. It's meant to be sexually suggested the same way that jazz is. I mean, this whole, Bolden is read as uh, a sexual avatar, basically, by his audiences. Women are competing to hold his handkerchief or his, uh, his instrument. <laughs> and we can see in 20th century American music that and the convergence of all these different drums into the standard trap drum set are really the two things that drive American popular music in the 20th century. The big beat, which is meant to be primal, and, and the sort of suggestive nature. I mean, you can't have rock and roll, you can't have rap, and you can't really have jazz without that sexual component there. And this is feeding a revolution in manners and morals that will hit the country at large in the 1920s. But it's happening in New Orleans at the very beginning of the 20th century. And this is a music that is seducing the young, proper young ladies of uptown society who are having debutante balls and demanding that their parents hire jazz bands because that's what's cool. And you'll find the same thing playing out in the 1950s with rock. So Bolden is important, and Bolden is the guy who is at least representative of a shift in the market away from the proper Victorian culture. And of course, anyone who studied Victorian culture, you know, once you lift the lid up, I mean, you see what's going on there too. It's highly sexualized, but there's a hypocrisy about it. What this younger generation is trying to do is break out of all that. And so the Freudianism, the flappers, the, uh, the flibbers, the, uh, you know, the... Uh, uh, the mobility that you get getting off the porch and into the car in the Model A. Uh, all of this is being fed by the emergence of jazz, which is the most appropriate theme song for this revolution in morals and manners. And it's coming out of New Orleans, and as Matt will show you, when it hits the national stage, there's a lot of resistance to it, precisely because it's so centralized. This is where Bolden performed, and again, urbanism is a factor here. That's Funky Butt Hall, also known as Kenneth Hall, or Labor Sons Hall. It was a union hall during the day. Sunday, you can look at it, you can guess what it is on Sunday, it's a church. <laughs> but on Saturday night, it is the den of unspeakable um, activity. Uh, Funky Butt Hall uh, relates to the lyrics of the song that was associated with uh, Buddy Bolden. Uh, but this is a, a prime example of mixed urban land use in New Orleans. Depending on what time of day, what day of the week it is, this structure is going through some big changes. This is in the back of town neighborhood, uh, very close to where City Hall is today in the Superdome. How many people know what happened to Buddy Bolden? He had a nervous breakdown. Yeah, I think, wasn't he in a mental institution for a while or yes. something? And a long while. He uh, was playing a Labor Day parade in 1906, and he uh, had a nervous breakdown on the street. There is speculation that it was alcoholism or cocaine abuse that might have led to that breakdown, or some other mental instability. In Don Marquis' book, you'll find that there is one newspaper account that he found of uh, Bolden showing up in the paper, and that is when he hits his mother-in-law over the head with an earthenware jar and is arrested as a result of that. In fact, my administrative assistant, Alma Williams Freeman, found an earlier uh, citation. Once you can keyword search the Times Picayune, you find things that you missed before. And that is that uh, when he was 13 years old, he held someone up in Central City at gunpoint, someone coming back from the, um, the food store. I guess he was hungry. Uh, he was arrested for that as well. So uh, that's a very familiar scenario in New Orleans. We're still dealing with these issues. Uh, in fact, Central City is still a very dangerous neighborhood uh, today. Uh, so to some extent, what I'm getting at is that Bolden was uh, 
perceived as a dangerous black man. And so the diagnosis of dementia that was applied to him may or may not have had foundation in fact, but it achieved its objective, which was to get him off the street, whether he was an alcoholic or a cocaine abuser or a misogynist or whatever he was, white authorities wanted him off the street. And so in 1907, he was, under a doctor's diagnosis, institutionalized in the state sanitarium in Jackson, Louisiana, and he remained there until his death in November 1931. So, so much for the first king of jazz. And there is a strong correlation between, shall we say, uh, mental instability and the biographies of many of these early jazzmen. Bolden was not the only one. Leon Rapolo, one of the greatest clarinetists in the white tradition, uh, with the New Orleans Rhythm Kings uh, particularly, uh, had similar problems and ended up uh, his last years of life in the institution. So Buddy Bolden gets something moving. This uh, is the band that uh, takes over. Basically, this is his band without him, the Eagle Band, uh, led by Edward Clem. Uh, in this particular case, it's Buddy Petit. Uh, his name was Joseph Crawford, but Buddy Petit in French is Little Buddy. Uh, that's a very popular nickname in New Orleans. Uh, I want you to pay attention to this guy here. His name is Big Eye Louis Nelson DeLille. He's an Afro-French Creole. His father was murdered in the uh, Robert Charles riot in July of 1900. Uh, he ended up uh, taking on uh, another name. And of course, Big Eye was not his baptismal name. It was <laughs> a nickname. Norse guys carried nicknames because it was part of their identification and, and either a physical attribute or how they played or how they dressed. But this is part of self-representation is very important. That nickname stands out. It's like Jelly Roll Morton. It's not his name. His name is Fernand Joseph Lamont. But Jelly Roll, which is a sexual metaphor that swings in both directions, uh, gets people's attention. And Morton is an anglicization of Mouton, which was his stepfather's name. Was he in relation to the same Mary nun? Um, uh, um, don't think that's come up, but the if you... Henriette she was a St. Mary Nelson. Oh, uh, that would be interesting to look into. Name. I thought you were referring to Morton, but in terms of Big Eye Louis Nelson, no one's done that genealogical work. That would be a very interesting thing to look into. Yeah. Okay, so you've seen him with the Eagle Band. Look, here he is again standing next to Bunk Johnson and Peter Bocage, who instead of being on cornet now is on violin, his original instrument. Bocage was uh, musically literate, uh, Eurocentric oriented musician. He's one of three Bocage brothers from Algiers. The father was a boat builder, but he didn't have enough money to give music lessons to all three kids, so the eldest son got them, Peter. The other two were intuitive, uh, head arrangement oriented musicians. But that's Big Eye Louie again with um, uh, Billy Morero and uh, Walter Grundy on drums. This is about the same time. And now he's working with Manuel Perez. There's Big Eye Louie there again. Perez on cornet in the background. The point is that when we think about bands today, we think about stable personnel and instrumentation. In early New Orleans jazz, you have pickup bands galore. In other words, the leader goes out and he gets a job, and then he says, okay, who can I get now that I've got the gig? And he finds his best man first, but if they're already working, then he starts looking a little deeper, to deeper levels. What are the implications of this kind of culture? They're very important. In order for people to get work like this and keep it, what it meant was that individual musicians had to develop a very expansive memory of repertoire. They had to be able to play with multiple bands with different repertoires, satisfying the taste of multiple audiences. Some want really hot jazz, some want people to you know, maybe mix waltzes and shottises and jazz. Uh, you have to be able to cover the spread. But, and this is where the nicknames come in, you also had to have a singular voice of your own on your instrument that made people want you. 
This is what every jazz musician aspires to, a singular voice like a signature that's unique. Oh, you want that sound? You want the guy that plays blues and mid-staff? Okay, well, that's Buddy Petit. Oh, no, you want the high note guy? That's Kid Rene. That's how these people are known. And so individual voices become the aspiration, the objective of jazz musicians. And, of course, the whole jazz culture is based on the idea of improvisation and head arrangements, but it's collective improvisation. It's not people taking solos. Even if they have their own voices, their responsibility is to mix with the other people in the band and to find a balance so that they are not taking anything away from their fellow bandmates. They find their niche and they stay there, but once they have it, they know what to do with it. And so the whole culture of pickup bands is extremely important in sort of creating a, a set of standard practices that are shared by all these young musicians of varying skill levels. Because some of these guys read music, some of them don't read music at all, and some of them read a little bit of music. They're called spellers. They can take a piece of sheet music, they can look at the chord progression, I got it. But they can't sight read the notes. But the guy next to them, usually the piano player, can sight read the notes. That's how they introduce new material into the collective rehearsal situation of head arrangements, where everyone works on it until they've got it the way they want it, but they leave windows of opportunity for improvisation in live performance to keep the audience guessing, to have that component that's necessary, that surprise that you have to have in a jazz performance. So collective improvisation in these bands, these pickup bands, is, uh, for example, if, if you are in your Mercedes Benz on the Autobahn. You can go 110 miles an hour. You can go more than that if you want. There's nothing in your way. But if you're driving in Rome or Paris, you've got to be looking around all the time to see what the other cars. That's the collective style of jazz improvisation in the world. It's more like the Rome and Paris model. You've got to be looking around all the time to see what's going on. The Sam Morgan band had a saying, who fall down, stay down. And what that means is that as long as you can keep up with what's going on in the bandstand, you can play. You mess up, get off the stage. We'd rather have you be quiet than to upset the balance of the playing style. That's what happens in the front line, but they've all got rhythmic responsibilities. New Orleans jazz bands are made up of a front line. Usually it's going to be led by a cornet or a trumpet player with a female response voice, very high pitch, obligato, arpeggiated runs most of the time from clarinet, very high voicing, and then a very guttural, masculine response voice from a slide trombone, doing slurs, glissandi, and whatnot. That's a frontline instrumentation that's standard in New Orleans, but it doesn't mean you can't have an accordion player with a valve trombone player and a drummer, like the accordion band had. It doesn't mean you can't have collective improvisation with nothing but stringed instruments like the 6th and 7th, 8th band did. It was called 6th and 7th, 8th band because uh, one of the players were like really short. <laughs> he was the 7th, 8th. That was a band formed by Edmond Souchon uh, in 1913. And they do collectively improvise the world as jazz, but there's no brass and reeds. It's all stringed instruments, mandolin, violin, guitar, bass, etc. I've been talking about urbanism, but it's also important to realize that there is uh, a coordination or a connection with the rural hinterland that's extremely important. These are not uh, static populations. This is a time of rapid urbanization and inflow from the country, but you've also got an outflow. Professor James B. Humphrey was an itinerant music educator who used to go on the plantation circuit including the Magnolia Plantation, which is on the west bank of the Mississippi River in Plaquemines Parish, Deer Range Plantation, also on the west bank, um, the Bel Air Plantation on the east bank of the Mississippi River. Bel Air is where Sam and Isaiah Morgan and Andrew Morgan came from, the Morgan brothers that were the foundational core of Sam Morgan's jazz band, a very important band that recorded in New Orleans in 1927. Some of the personnel came from Deer Range. Jim Robinson, the trombone player, who was a guitar player when he was at Deer Range, 
and uh, his nephew, uh, Sidney Brown, who went by the name of Jim Little on base. Uh, in 1915, there was a major hurricane that hit New Orleans right about Grand Isle and had essentially the same flooding footprint as Katrina did. It destroyed Deer Range Plantation. The Morgans were at Bel Air when the hurricane hit. It convinced them that Blackman's was not the place to be. They moved to the city. Jim Robinson and Jim Little had already moved to New Orleans, but were going back and forth. Now they couldn't go back. There was no place to go back to. So sometimes natural disasters are influencing the development of bands. These guys, these two contingents from Plaquemines, separate, didn't know each other before. They come to New Orleans, they meet up, they hook up with some New Orleans musicians, they create one of the most uh, celebrated jazz bands of the mid-1920s, Sam Morgan's Jazz Band. It sounds like a fusion of country and city. Kidori, who becomes the most popular band leader in New Orleans after Bolden's Fall from Grace, Basically, from about 1910 to 1919, when he fled to California, Kidori builds what becomes uh, the incubator for the classic jazz recording cadre that leaves New Orleans and goes to Chicago uh, in the late teens and early 20s. Uh, Ori is shown here in a sugarcane field after the harvest in his hometown, La Place, Louisiana. Uh, you can see that if we were to describe this band, we say, well, these are African Americans. But if we ask ourselves, well, who are Ori's people? His father, Ozan Jean Ori, was a white man. His mother, Octavie Devezan, was Afro Spanish and Native American. So even though Ori would have been identified as a quadroon, meaning one African heritage grandparent, in the 19th century, uh, under segregation, he was uh, considered to be black, legally. And his is the first, uh, I've already talked about the original Dixieland Jazz Band making the first jazz recording. The first recording by an African-American jazz band from New Orleans is one led by Kid Ory in Santa Monica, California in May of 1922 for the North Scott label. But if we interrogate Ory's genealogy, we see that uh, he's much more than just African heritage. He's European heritage, he's African heritage, he's Spanish heritage, he's French heritage, he's Native American heritage. He's like a gumbo person. He represents the full spectrum of race and ethnicity in New Orleans, in an individual. Fairly typical of a creolized middle ground. This is where Ori performed frequently. It's Economy Hall in Treme. It doesn't exist anymore as a result of Hurricane Betsy in 1965. What was left of Economy Hall imploded. Now this is a site like the Oddfellows Hall that's for rent. Kid Ory didn't join the Societe de Comme so he could play there. He rents it out. And in fact, Ory was such a sharp businessman, there were two primary dance halls in Treme in the teens. One was Economy Hall, the other was called Hope's Hall or Cooperators Hall. Sometimes known as, uh, this was sometimes also known as Cheapskates Hall because of <laughs> economy. What Ori would do, particularly when he had Louis Armstrong in his band after Joe Oliver leaves uh, in 1918 and goes to Chicago, Armstrong takes his place. Armstrong becomes an instant station locally, certainly more than Bolden uh, because he's a little kid, but he really can play. And everyone's amazed by him. Uh, what Ori would do would be to rent both halls for the night, keep Hope's Hall dark, so that anyone in Treme wanted to hear some music had to go to the at all. They weren't disappointed. Now eventually what happened was uh, his business partner at the Claiborne Theater, Pete Lala, found out about this. He felt that he had an interest in Ori's band because they had been business partners, and so he had connections with the police and the police started showing up to run the lines waiting to get into Economy Hall off. And uh, Ori's band was actually busted by the police on at least two occasions, 1917 and uh, I think uh, 1918. So uh, even though he said he moved to California in 1919 for his health because of emphysema, it was in fact uh, because he had a business deal going wrong with a Sicilian gangster 
uh, Pete Lala was uh, a cha-cha uh, and was, uh, shall we say, uh, well-connected. As were lots of the club owners. It's not just about uh, who played, it's about where they played. And in many cases, uh, uh, groceries and bars and saloons, cabarets, were uh, often operated by Sicilians. Okay, we're going to move very quickly from this point on because we're talking about the diaspora now. We're talking about New Orleans bands leaving uh, New Orleans and taking the New Orleans message elsewhere. But keep in mind that New Orleans is a very quirky place, and so the things that you do to please audiences in New Orleans aren't necessarily going to work in other locations. Not everybody understands what gumbo or red beans and ice is. Uh, and if you try to get some in Oakland, you'll, you'll know that that's true. I tried. <laughs> the original Creole Orchestra, uh, led by Bill Johnson, William Manuel Johnson on bass, uh, has George Baquet uh, on clarinet, Freddie Capard on cornet, uh, Bill's drummer, Oliver Johnson, better known as Dink Johnson, was the drummer, uh, Jimmy Palau uh, on clarinet. Uh, this is a band made up of African Americans and Creoles. And as I mentioned earlier, the problem is they took a dance music on the vaudeville stage. They never had the chance to really connect with the proper audience. And so even though they were offered a recording contract, they could have been the first to record some New Orleans jazz. Freddie Capard refused it because he felt, well, what do I need that for? If I make a record and everybody hears my style, my voice, then they can steal it, and pretty soon they're going to get the work I could get. So what's important for me is to keep my voice to myself, and if anyone wants that voice, they have to hire me right now. He did not realize the economic implications of once you make this piece of technology, a million of them can go in all directions and you might make some money. However, the other reason he refused the contract was African American musicians were offered less money in the studio than their white counterparts were. So it's not that they were frozen out, but they were not treated with requisite respect. And uh, he was a Creole from New Orleans. He had a lot of pride. He was not going to go for that. And so uh, this band passed on that recording. Opportunity. Eventually, because of interpersonal dynamics, they had a falling out uh, and ultimately broke up in Chicago in 1918. After a four-year run, very important. But if you read Gushy's Pioneers of Jazz, you'll see it's a fascinating story and that uh, the claims of the original Dixieland Jazz Band to be the first to take jazz on the road uh, need to be qualified because this was an important band. This is the kind of place they would have played. Uh, this uh, is on Dauphine Street, the French Quarter. Uh, originally, it was a palace uh, theater for uh, white audiences. Eventually, uh, because the segregation is handed off, it becomes lax only, like the Iroquois Theater. Uh, segregation had big implications in terms of uh, who could be in the audience, but not necessarily who could be on stage. What you don't find is white performer black audience very often, unless you're in the street. But you will find black performer black audience, black performer white audience, quite typically. Uh, because to some extent, black performers are uh, fetishized racially. They're part of, you know, they dress them up in tuxedos or whatever. Now they could charge more money for doing that, but at the same time, they are meeting an expectation that has racist implications. Or it can, not always, but it can. Uh, this is one of the bands that uh, performed, again, Sicilian's Joe Fulco, uh, one of his bands performing at the uh, Palace Theater in 1919 before it became a black venue. This is the incubator for most of the white uh, jazz musicians who formed bands like the original Dixieland Jazz Band or Tom Brown's Band from Dixieland or the New Orleans Rhythm Kings. The three important bands that left New Orleans and hit Chicago and New York. Uh, this is Jack Lane. Remember I told you about Chick Martin, Martin Abraham from the Lower French Quarter? There he is. That's Jack Lane's uh, son, Pansy, Alfred Lane. Uh, that's uh, Dee Dee Stevens, the drummer. This is Elsie Nunez. He's an Isleño. When we talk about Latino heritage here, we're not just talking about Iberian Spain or Mexican or Cuban. We're talking about Filipino. We're talking about Salvadorian. We're talking about Isleño. Uh, people want to know, well, why was this nickname yellow? Uh, L.C. Yellow Nunez. Well, Canary Islands, canaries are what color? Yellow. So that's my guess. 
but no one's ever proved it. These are two brothers, the Mello brothers, M-E-L-L-O. -L -L uh, everyone thinks they're Sicilian because of the surname, which is actually uh, a Hispanic name, but because of the Hispanic presence in Sicily, lots of Sicilians have Hispanic surnames. But in fact, if you read their oral histories, the family was from France. So they migrated. And again, the, the lifting of layers to try to get at the reality of ethnicity is something you have to do in early New Orleans jazz. This band did not really travel. It uh, was an incubator in the 90s and up until about 1917. Uh, Layton remained musically active, but basically by World War I, he was retired. He was a volunteer fireman as well. This is one of the bands that was spawned. I, I mentioned Ray Lopez growing up in the Lower French Quarter. That's Ray right there. That's the leader, Tom Brown, from the Irish Channel. And that's Larry Shields, who lived next door to Buddy Bolden in Central City. Shields was with this band, uh, but he soon migrated to the original Dixieland Jazz Band, which is this band. These are the people that claim to be uh, the originators of jazz, or at least this man does, Nick Rockham. There's Shields again, Henry Regis from Treme, Anthony Sparborough, another Italian-American, Edwin Edwards, not to be confused with our former illustrious governor, recently released in the Italian kind of country, uh, was the only person who could read music in this band. The rest of them are uh, uh, fakers and spellers. Central City, where both Holden and Shields are from, Manuel Mineta, Oscar Celestan, one of the bands with Leon Polo in it on clarinet, sitting on the piano, also with George Brunis on slide trombone, it's a band led by Paul Marez, the guy who studied the Milano Conservatory, the French Opera House, it's right there, that's Arnold Laicata. He learned how to play arco at the Milano Conservatory. And he used it occasionally in a jazz performance, but most of the time he's all about slap style bass, much more percussive approach to the instrument that drives the rhythm. And you heard the Fister Sisters the other night, the repertoire you were listening to, these three ladies, the Boswell Sisters, uh, not born in New Orleans, but they grew up here, uptown on Camp Street. Uh, their musical associations are very interesting because they were friends with Emmett Hardy, Louis Prima, and Leon Prima, the Prima boys from Treme. Emmett Hardy was from the West Bank, from Gretna. Uh, basically, they grew up near what's called Jefferson, which is not far between Napoleon and Louisiana, uh, a block off the magazine on Camp Street. But they revolutionized uh, close army singing and uh, on the bibliography, you'll find a citation by uh, an article by Laurie Strass, an award-winning article. I encourage you to read it, because even though I have not been talking about women that much in today's lecture, I want to emphasize the fact that despite the limitations placed on them in the first two decades of the 20th century, which was essentially, you could sing and you could play piano, and that's it in terms of jazz bands, the presence of women is extremely important because Originally, the association of jazz with vice and poverty, the Storyville connection is overdrawn in a sort of um, uh, simplified accounts of jazz origins. You know, Storyville was only one place where you could find jazz, and you wouldn't find it in the brothels, you'd find it a block away, uh, away on the dance halls on Franklin Street, like the Tuxedo, or uh, a few clothes, or in Big 25. But the fact is that there, any woman who was associated with jazz bands in the early period was considered to be nothing better than a prostitute. But in maybe Day Dune's case, she had been a prostitute. She was trying to get out of it, trying to uh, reconfigure her life. And so, uh, you know, this is, this is uh, an impediment uh, for uh, women who want to get involved in playing jazz. But eventually, women who, when you saw them, you knew this woman could not possibly be. Uh, associated with vice because she is too refined, she is too elegant, that presence of women on piano begins to domesticate or domesticize the image of the jazz band. And it helps when you're looking for gigs to wear a tuxedo, to have a beautiful woman in the band who can play, becomes uh, a sales problem, becomes something that not only changes perceptions of jazz, 
but enables jazz musicians to get work. And so by the mid-1920s, one thing you'll find is many jazz bands have women on piano. Louis Prima, good friends. Uh, oh, let me just mention Fishbein Williams Syncopator. So we were talking about Jewish connection. Uh, uh, Charlie Fishbein was from Romania, violin player, classically trained, was exposed to jazz, started a jazz band. Buzzy Williams from Birmingham, Alabama became his collaborator. But anybody ever says, well, you know, was there ethnic diversity in New Orleans jazz? I pull out this band name, Fishbein Williams Syncopators. I think it says it all. <laughs> this is another valuable shot of an audience, the Knights of Pythias. Uh, opening night, when we look at uh, this creolized population, uh, it really is uh, a diverse group of people. Segregation tried to define this group as simply black. When you look at the, the faces, I use this as my screensaver because it, there's endless inspiration attached to this image. When you start reading the faces of people, the conversations going on, you realize what the jazz audience was all about, how important they are, how diverse they were, and how good they were. <laughs> That's the Morgan band that I was talking about, came in from the country. But I'm looking, here she is. I'm going to end here. But this is Jeanette Salva, uh, who becomes Jeanette Kimball eventually when she marries the band player, uh, the banjo player, Narvin Kimball. Uh, she was a proper young lady, uh, Creole heritage. She grew up in Bay St. Louis. Uh, and there was a split in this band. In 1925, uh, the trumpet player uh, began uh, booking the band without the knowledge of the trombone player. Uh, William Baby Ridgely had been the leader of the band. Oscar Selvestan uh, wanted to be the leader of the band. And so uh, word got out, and the band, the original Tuxedo Jazz Orchestra, broke into two different original Tuxedo Jazz Orchestras, one led by Celestan, one led by Ridgely. <laughs> Sweet Emma Barrett was hired by Ridgely as his female piano player, and Jeanette Salvant was hired by Celestan. In order for him to get Jeanette's mother to agree to her participation running with this band, he had to promise to be a 24-hour day chaperone to her, which was promising a lot, but Celestan made good on it. And this is what I mean when I say that the uh, insinuation that any woman who was connected to jazz was somehow uh, connected to vice as well. You look at Jeanette Salvan and you go, that would be impossible. She's too refined, she's too much of a lady. And so this is a marketing ploy because every photo you see of this band from this 1925 on, she's always right in the center of the picture. And it's not a mistake. They are using her to gain work because she's gorgeous, she's refined, and she can play. She was a great improviser. Was the, there was a question over here. Yeah, I was just wondering when you talked about the ladies associated with jazz. I saw a PBS uh, documentary about Jelly Girl recently, and they were saying that some people believe that the name jazz, the origins, came from the jasmine perfume that the prostitutes wore, and they said that they showed a picture of a guy with a, a drum and it had the word jazz, J-A-S-S, -S, mm -hmm. and they think that it evolved after that to that. Do you know of, of there, that? That's a very contested uh, terrain. Uh, one of the ironies that we find is that we do not find documentation of the word jazz associated with Storyville in New Orleans, although we do find it in Chicago and San Francisco. Right now, most people, uh, the etymology of the word is also problematical. Because of the French culture in New Orleans, jazé, which is to chatter, uh, has often been used. The J-A-S-S, <coughs> LaRocca tells a story about, because their first record, they used the J-A-S-S, -S, and then subsequent printings, J-A-Z-Z. -Z. And he tells the story of the subways in New York when they were up there in 1917, that um, there were advertisements for the band, and that the street urchins riding the subway would cross out the J. Uh, so the original Dixieland ass band. <laughs> and uh, LaRocca took on bridge with that, and he said, well, we can't you know, have that. But the thing is that what you really find is that multiple spellings, when, when this, the fluidity of first impact of New Orleans music, people didn't know how to dance to it in Chicago and New York. They didn't know what to make of it. 
it was really novel, and in every case there's a kind of rite of baptism where someone in the band or some dancers in the audience demonstrate how you have fun to this New Orleans music. Uh, the Lopez, uh, the uh, Mr. Jazz himself, the Holbrook article on, on uh, Ray Lopez, tells that story. And it's a very interesting one. What happens in Chicago, just because uh, a theater troupe that had been to New Orleans previously showed up at the club in Chicago where they were playing, and they had been to New Orleans, they knew how to react to New Orleans music, and they demonstrated for the rest of the Chicago audience, and all of a sudden things turned around for them. Same thing happens with the original Dixieland Jazz Band and Rising Levers in New York. But the, uh, the origin theory of the word that I find the most compelling is a mid-19th century word that begins to appear in novels in the 1860s, jism, jasm. Uh, and it means two things. It means uh, semen, and not the merchant semen, the other kind of semen, and to do something with great pep or speed. And so you can see how this would work its way into brothel culture at some point. But the irony is that when you read the Holbrook article on Lopez, the word jazz did exist in New Orleans on the vaudeville stage. He says the first time he heard it, he thinks it was about 1910, and it was William Demarest in a Canal Street theater rehearsing an act and telling his assistant, put more jazz into it, and it was more pep, more gut. The word jazz is also to be found in Army Air Corps uh, manuals to burp an engine on an airplane at the time was to jazz it. And so uh, the first time you see it in print is in Los Angeles, uh, 1912, then in Call Bulletin in San Francisco, 1913, in relation to the spirit of a sports team, uh, a baseball team called the San Francisco Seals, Art Hickman's band was playing for their, uh, their camp, and the term migrates to, to be applied to Hickman's style of music, and then goes from San Francisco to Chicago, where it is applied to Tom Brown's band from Dixieland in a negative way. The story is the Musicians Union branded them a jazz band because they were scabs and they weren't union members, and they wanted to do that to, uh, to uh, keep people away, and it had the opposite effect. It attracted people that and the baptism of fire under, how do you dance this music? Oh, this is fun. Uh, so that sexual connotation is there sometimes, other times it's not, uh, but the only time we found it connected to New Orleans is in the Lopez story related to this Canal Street Theater. But you know, the, the most recent theory is that it's actually Irish, and uh, this is something that popped up on the net uh, a few years ago, but it hasn't really been embraced by jazz scholars. But this, we're going to be working on, on where that word came from for a long time. And today, a uh, New Orleans uh, trumpeter who plays multiple styles, Nick Payton, uh, has challenged the use of the term. And he wants, it, uh, wants us to call it black American music. So you'll see, if you see BAM in any blogs, that's what it stands for, black American music. And Nick Payton is, you know, serious about that. Uh, and so, you know, we, uh, this is part of the fun. What historians love is, is not total consensus, right? We like a little conflict. It creates work. Uh, it makes us think <laughs> about things. So uh, as far as the word jazz is concerned, we haven't run out of options there. Um, does orchestra sort of um, sanitize the idea of jazz or, or make it more respectable, like when it says the original tuxedo, instead of just jazz band, it's jazz orchestra? I think it does. I, I think we should be open to reading every one of these terms for nuances and to look critically at this history because, you know, my job is, as curator is to uh, remind people that we can't be complacent about jazz origins. I'm just giving you my theories here. There are, there are other ways of looking uh, at this material. I've worked on it for a long time, so I'm sharing what I've come up with. I don't think I've finished yet. And I hope uh, I can attract all of you to uh, think about this material and maybe to engage it, uh, to work on it, because uh, that's my job as curator of the Jazz Archive, is bring people in to work with material and bring in the, the good people who can really interpret this material, people like Tom Brothers, for example, or Matt. Uh, so uh, that's this is an ongoing story. Today was just a first taste. But thanks very much for your attention. Thank you.